Yes. We're in the mic the Xbox booth here at, at E3 and we're catching up with Raphael from uh, Hinterland Studios. Uh, you actually had a, a big announcement on the stage of, of, uh, of the Xbox press conference this year. The Long Dark, a game that we've been following for a while, first on Kickstarter, early access, now on Xbox Game Preview as well. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> First of all, let's introduce people to, to what the Long, Long Dark sure. is. What, what kind of game is it? So the Long Dark is a first-person survival simulation. Um, currently it's a sandbox game, so there's a story mode coming later this year, but what people are playing right now is our free-form, non-narrative, open-world sandbox. It's purely about survival, so there's no zombies. It's really just about you in the middle of the wilderness with the clothes on your back, trying to see how far you how long you can survive for and so you have to learn the environment you have to learn all the skills that you need to survive you have to constantly explore and move to find more resources whether it's food or clothing or tools eventually weapons like a bow and a rifle that you use for hunting um, the main threats to you are actually mother nature itself so you have to be aware of the wind the weather changing how exposed you are how warm you are uh, animals like wolves and bears, things like that. And then of course there's the other aspect of nature which is what it can give you. So you have things like rabbits that you can trap, fishing, hunting, etc, etc. Eventually, once you've survived long enough, if you survive long enough, um, a lot of the man-made items like items of clothing or food that you might find in cans and things are, you'll use them all up because the items don't respawn in the world. So once you've used up the, all those things, they're gone. So then you will have to turn to your survival skills to help you survive. So you'll have to make your own clothes. You'll have to find ways to trap and hunt and fish. You'll have to be able to um, make your own tools, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's really purely a survival simulation. Um, it, I think uh, we really focus mostly on the management of the resource or of the uh, of things like your hunger, your thirst, your fatigue, your how cold you are, et cetera, et cetera. And so the whole, all the mechanics are built around trying to maintain your condition as long as you can, so that you can survive for as long as you can. I think one of the things that that sort of attracted me to sort of learn more about it was the fact that the, the setting, the, the wilderness, and and that landscape that is. Speaks to me some from Northern Europe. Like there, yeah. there's something about that 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 landscape that you don't see that often in, in video games. So can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to go for that and what it adds to the experience? Well, for a long time I've been interested in the idea of wilderness survival, and uh, the studio has said, well, we're actually based in Canada on Vancouver Island, and I'm a Canadian. So for I've worked in the industry for a lot of years, and and always felt like, you know, because we're always making games for an international audience that we often can't show like a bit of our own culture in them. So for me, it was important to make a game that was set in Canada. We have a Canadian story, Canadian protagonist, you know, Canadian flags in the game even. So we're kind of proud about showing that and I think it gives it a bit of a unique personality. But specifically, the wilderness survival, I think what's interesting is in our backstory, we, we basically set it up that there's been a, some kind of an unexplained geomagnetic anomaly and suddenly all technology is not working anymore. And that really brings mankind down you know, to the basics again. So we're not at the top of the food chain anymore. We can't rely on the technology that we take for granted today. And this brings us into a really a true survival situation. So we have to come to terms with this new world order that we're in and find ways to kind of reconnect with those old skills that we've lost in a lot of cases. And there's a lot of, I think, thematic elements elements around the idea of you know what what does it mean to be isolated by yourself without access to phones and social media and all the things that we kind of use now to be connected to the rest of the world and what does that do to you psychologically so i think that we're exploring a lot of those ideas doing our best to do that with creating a very immersive environment with, you know a lot of emphasis on the the atmosphere so the art style and the lighting and the music and the sound effects to really let the player feel like they're actually in a wilderness scenario and 
the feedback that we have so far is very much positive that we're really delivering on that. And, and I think it, I just think it, it's so different from what people typically are finding in games right now. It's, I mean, even look at A3, it's, there's so many amazing games here, but there's, every trailer is like explosions and fire and like whatever. And so we're almost, we really almost don't even fit in at all because we're so more like meditation, you know, walking through the woods and listening to the wind blowing through the trees and looking at the wildlife and looking at the sunset. And that's really what we're all about. Because, I mean, when you hear the word survival, you kind of tend to feel that there's constant peril and constant danger and that, that sort of thing. But that's not always the case. Well, the truth is that as, the time, as time passes, every minute that passes, you're closer to death in our game. So death is an inevitability. You're, everybody will eventually die, kind of like in life. But I think what's interesting in The Long Dark is the contrast that we have with the sense of the world and the feeling of beauty that's in the world contrasted with the danger in nature. And that is really true to what nature is. Nature is in incredibly beautiful, but also nature doesn't care if you survive or not. It's really, you know, neutral in that sense. And I think that's actually like a, in a some people talk about it, you know, they ask us, is it a horror game? And I say, it's not a horror game and it's not scary, but you're gonna be very unsettled. You're gonna be uncomfortable because you're gonna realize you're in this beautiful open expanse and everything can kill you and it doesn't matter if you live or die. And I think that's a, a strange thing for people that are used to, you know, instead of uh, power fantasy in our game where we give you a big gun and power armor and big muscles and stuff, we give you the opposite. We give you a vulnerability fantasy. So we drop you in a scenario where you know you can't win. And it's interesting because that makes people try even harder. And when they are successful, even every extra day that they survive is like a triumph, you know, and they feel that ownership for that success. It's interesting because you talked about sort of the the, 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 the the grand vision, why this is this is happening. You, we, I understand like a big part of the narrative is what the player experiences from day to day and that sort of thing. But you did talk about a story mode as well. Sure. And I, what, what's the approach there? Is it, is, it a, is it a personal story about the character or is it is it about the sort of the greater things that have happened or what? What kind of story are you telling with that? I think what we're what we're trying to do is because sandbox sandbox is really purely about the player story. So it's the moment, the minute to minute decisions that I make and my personal story of how I managed to survive. With the story mode, we really want to deliver like an actual authored story. So we have characters that we're creating, we have a world that we're creating because we want to bring our players into that. We really believe strongly in storytelling, and we, we you know we have a we sp we have a lot of um, you know we have a pretty amb big great ambitions for what we want to do with story mode. We have some amazing talent that we've attached to the project as well. I don't know if you remember hearing of this before, but we have Mark Muir, Jennifer Hale. Uh, Elias Tofexis and David Hayter, who are four of probably the most well-known voice actors, right? And so that's the level of like talent that we can attract to the to the project and the story because people are very, uh, for some reason, they're very connected emotionally to the to the idea of the game and all these themes that I mentioned, isolation and and whatnot. But back to your question, it's it's both a personal story because the mechanics of the game are part of the story of how I survive from day to day. But you will take on a role of a character in the story mode. There is a plot that you're going to follow through. Um, so hopefully it'll have a little bit of both and in the end players will feel that sense of connection to the world and you know I really we really want people to f kind of fall in love with the characters that we've created for them um, you know that's th th really important to us as veterans of the sort of the early access system and now sort of pioneers in the Xbox game preview what, what do you feel that that offers you as a developer being able to sort of get the feedback from players and and you, you have experience, obviously, from both these things. Sure. How do they compare? Yeah, I mean, I think when we first brought the game to early access, well, first starting with Kickstarter and bringing our, you know, starting our community that way, I think we all, you know, most of my team comes from that AAA, you know, industry where you work on a game for a long time and you can't talk about it to anybody, and then suddenly it's out and you cross your fingers and hope that people like it, but you don't really know until it launches, right? And I think a lot of us really fell in love with the idea of being able to, like, speak directly to our audience, to the people who love our game, and people who have criticisms of the game as well. It was very kind of a, a strange experience for us because we're so used to kind of being behind the PR machine, right? And so that's that started with Kickstarter, and then when we went to Early Access, we suddenly had a much bigger audience, so we had to learn how to communicate with them, and Steam can be a challenge kind of just in terms of how the audience is. And so I think it's it's been really interesting just as a learning process for us. Of course, we get really useful feedback. We can pull data. We can 
learn a lot about our players that you know we we make us we always make assumptions about our players and what they would like and when we have that many players and we can hear what they think we can find the truth right and i mean a good example of that is um you know about three or four months ago we we, up, we added the notion of experience modes to the game which is kind of like difficulty modes but the idea is that we we recognized from our community that we had certain players that really wanted just like a very challenging survival scenario and then we had other players that were looking for kind of a balance and then we had another set of players that wanted the game they didn't really want to be challenged they just wanted to soak up the atmosphere of the game and so we thought well it's one game how can it be that how could it be all those things to all those people and so we introduced this idea of experience modes where we tune the game a little bit differently depending on those experiences and then with our metrics we can see what which our players choose and we were really surprised to find out that you know the vocal people that you hear from all the time on on steam for example are the people that are looking for that more sort of challenging hardcore experience that really want it to be the most ultimate survival game ever and we found out that that was like 15 percent of our audience right and we found out that more than 35 percent of our audience were the ones that wanted that really quiet sort of thoughtful experience and then the rest were in the middle kind of where we thought that we should be so it was a really interesting learning experience for us to get that information and I think that's a good example of how this kind of open development model allows us to have a much better understanding of what our players are looking for. Now bringing the game to Xbox One and game preview is, is sort of like uncharted territory. I mean Microsoft, it's new for them, it's new for us, it's, it's new for everyone new, and especially new for console players. And I think we're really excited because it feels kind of like you know you discovered a new culture that's never been put, like influenced by other things. So they they because. Survival games grew up on Steam and early access. It's only they've only really been around for a couple of years now, and there aren't any survival games on the console. I think we're actually the first one, and so we're bringing this new concept and this new style of gameplay to a completely new audience who's actually used to something totally different. So, I mean, maybe it's going to completely flop. I have no idea. Maybe they're not looking for that kind of experience. But for us, it's going to be really interesting to get feedback from a different type of player and learn what they're looking for. And with with the free trial, you're also getting a much you you get the canvas sort of potential players as well, not right. just the, the people who buy into it, but also like, why why don't they buy into yeah. it and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a, a, it was a good choice for Microsoft. I think they know that, um, you know, early access can can have a reputation for being, you know, unfortunately it's, it's, it's earned a reputation. A, a lot of the projects that are out there are not very high quality. A lot of the teams are quite inexperienced. Fortunately, we've, we've put a lot of effort into making sure that our game feels like a very polished experience from the very, very beginning. And of course, we have bugs like every game, but we fix them right away. And the game is, you know, we're seen on, on Steam as being one of the best run early access games, which is why Microsoft asked us if we wanted to be on this project. Like, we didn't ask them to join it. We didn't know anything about it. They came to us and said, hey, we want to do this. You're one of the projects that's the best run. Would you be part of this with us? And so it's a pretty great validation for us of how things have been going. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's just it's it's kind of great for us to just be part of this experience, and um, you know, I, I just think open development is really kind of a new uncharted territory for for everyone, and it's sort of interesting to see how some of the big AAA studios are trying to embrace that model now too, because they see the value in in getting that playtesting feedback and and having that closeness to the community, which is really I think the main benefit that we have right now. And uh, do you do you have any thoughts on when you think that you'll sort of get out of this early access game preview mode sure. and, and sort of deliver that full experience? Yeah, I mean, we always, in our minds, separated the sandbox portion of the game as the pure mechanics, and then the story mode is something different. And, you know, when we first came to early access, I mean, we didn't plan to go to early access when we started the game or when we were even on Kickstarter. It was something that kind of came along later on, and we thought, well, we can't do it because we're story driven and we don't want to show the story when it's not finished. So how do we do this? And then we realized, oh, well, actually, we can take the game mechanics and put them over here and the world and people can play in it and we can learn about that. And then the story mode can develop sort of in parallel on the side because it's layered on top of the mechanics. And so we always have intended that, you know, this the early access period will end when the story mode launches and then we'll be finished and we'll move on to the next phase of development. So our plan right now is to launch the story mode it's episodic, so the first episode of it uh, by the end of the year, and that will be the point where the long dark comes out of early access and comes out of game preview. And then, you know, we'll see. We, we, we hope that it's successful enough that we can continue to do more seasons, so like a season long dark two, long dark three, season three. And, you know, maybe we would come back to early access at that point to test and, and get feedback. I'm not, I'm not sure how we might do that. But, but currently the plan is early access until we launch the story mode and then we're finished with early access. And I think it was really important for us and for our fans to know that we have an idea of where it's going to end, as opposed to having it be completely open and it's just going to go forever, right? 
All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. All right. I really appreciate it. Thank you.